Hey there, welcome to day 20. In this one, we are going to be using the Google Maps API to extract a geocode location that is latitude and longitude to find places in that area using the places API. So let's go ahead and jump in. And we're going to be using the Google Maps platform on Google Cloud. Now, for what we're doing here, the cost should be nothing. It should be absolutely free. If for some reason your system or your calls end up being a lot more than what I'm doing here, then you get a free $300 credit that Google Maps platform just gives to everybody. It's not like this is a sponsor post or anything like that. Um, it's just they give you this free credit just for signing up on their cloud platform. So go ahead and go to cloud.google.com and sign in. And once you sign in, you're gonna see something like this. Now make sure that you create a new project up here. It's probably gonna ask you to do that. Uh, and then also activate your billing again so we can actually use these APIs. But if you, for some reason, are uncomfortable with keeping your billing on there, after you do this, just delete that card and you shouldn't be billed for anything or just contact them to make sure that that happens. Uh, Google Cloud, in my experience, has been very responsive to that because they want people to learn how to use their platform. No surprise there. Um, okay, so with that out of the way, what we need to do is actually talk about some of the requirements that we have going. Number one, we're gonna be using the Python request library. This is just to do our API calls. Now, this is not required, but it's a much easier way to do it. Uh, next, we're gonna be using Python pandas. Now, this is just to put all of our data in a structure that's a lot easier to work with than like a Python dictionary. And it's also super fast. Uh, so those are the couple reasons that I do that. The final reason for pandas is to actually really easily save our data into a CSV file for future reference if we need it. Um, so the other note that I wanna say is that a lot of the things that we're gonna do here can be used in the Google Maps services client. So the Python client can actually do it. Uh, so the purpose of this is not completely just to use the Google Maps API, but also to understand a little bit more about how to actually interact with any API and sort of parse the documentation that's on there because they don't always have clients and they don't always keep their clients up to date. Uh, so luckily for us, Google Maps actually does keep it mostly up to date. Um, so that is pretty nice. But again, we want to actually dive into this a little bit more. But even if you are going to be using the Python client library, you're going to want to have to set up the APIs itself inside of the Google Cloud platform. All right, so let's go ahead and set up our base project inside of 30 days of Python. I'm going to go ahead and do day 20 and I'm going to create a virtual environment inside of day 20 specifically for our Jupyter Notebook and I'm going to CD into day 20. Now, of course, this is meant so you can pick up pretty much at any time, just go into day 20 and get all the requirements there. So we'll go ahead and do Pippi and V Jupyter Notebook, or rather just Jupyter and Requests and Pandas. So those are the three real solid requirements for this. All right, now with that done, let's go ahead and do Pippi and V Run Jupyter Notebook. And we're gonna go ahead and create our new notebook, Python 3. And I'll just call it geo coding and places API with Google Maps. Okay, now there's a couple of notes I wanna make and that's this. So first steps, we're gonna sign up for Google Cloud. Hopefully you've already done that. Next, we're gonna go ahead and create a project inside of Google Cloud. Again, hopefully you've already done that. And then we're gonna activate the API services that we want, which is geo coding API and places API. And then finally, we're gonna grab an API key and restrict. So this is the primary thing that you need to do before you can actually use their APIs. All right, so inside of Google Cloud Platform, we're gonna go ahead and make sure that we have a project here. Now, my rule of thumb is that if I'm doing research and development, I create a project for that. Every other project that's like a potentially a real live production project, I create a specific project for that. And the reason for this, it has to do with billing, but also to make sure that if I add people to that project, it's not like they have access to everything that I've got and it just kind of makes it a lot easier to work with, which I think is why they have projects in general. Uh, so the next thing is we need to activate the APIs that we want this particular project to have access to. 
So we're gonna go ahead and do a search for Google Maps. And we're not gonna find anything. Maybe eventually we will, but right now we won't. Why is that? Well, that's because a lot of the Google services, like Google Maps, is inside of the APIs and services library. So if you ever need to use the YouTube API, you're gonna find this. And of course, doing an actual Google search outside of GCP will help you find those APIs as well and probably even give you this API library page too. Uh, but it is important to note that going to the right place is critical here. It's also important to note that GCP has a ton of services and they'll keep adding to it. I don't think it's a uh, useful time, useful use of your time to actually try and learn all of these services. But uh, let's go back into the API library and I'm going to go ahead and search for the two services I need. So the geocoding API. And I'm going to go ahead and command click to open it into a new tab or control click if you're on Windows. And then I'm also going to open up the places API. Now there's a couple notes I want to make before we actually enable those back into the library itself. If you type out Google Maps in here, you will see a bunch of interesting things, right? So you'll see this Maps Embed API. We're not going to be doing that because we're not working on a web application. That's also true for the Maps JavaScript API. Um, if you want to actually visualize the map, it takes a lot more programming to get there. That's something we're just not going to do right now. Uh, instead, we're just going to be focusing on the data because we only need Python to do that. Um, so there's definitely a lot of things inside of Google Maps that allow for this. One of the things that you might be like, oh, I accidentally did geolocation API. Well, we can't do that either. We have to use the geocoding API because what that's going to do is give us a latitude and longitude from an address, city, or zip code, or postal code. A geolocation requires you to actually have a device's physical location, which means you need this to actually work on a device. Perhaps there's a way to do it through the web, but again, that's a little bit more complicated. Okay, so now clicking on our recently opened tabs for geocoding API, we're gonna go ahead and click enable, and then also places API, we'll go ahead and click enable as well. Um, so we'll use the geocoding API to say like, hey, I wanna find food in Newport Beach, California. So we use geocoding to do the Newport Beach part, and then places API to do the food part. Um, so that's what we're gonna be doing. Okay, so now that we've got those things, what I need to do now is go back into APIs and services and actually create my API key. So inside of credentials is where we're gonna do it. Now OAuth 2 requires you to have a web application, so some sort of callback place. So we're not using OAuth 2. Service counts is for various things on Google Cloud Platform. There are other ways to use service accounts as well, uh, but what we need for our API calls is gonna be just a straight up API key. It's just one single key that will pass through our URLs. So you might be like, hey, that sounds kind of, uh, kind of dangerous, as in it seems like it's just gonna be open for anyone to use. So we'll solve that in just a moment. I'm gonna go ahead and create this API key, and there it is. I'm gonna first reference this, Notice that it says by passing it with a key equals to API key parameter. Um, I'll also put that in here as well. So let's bring this into our notebook and I'll say API key equals to that string. Now, of course you could try and copy my string and use it, but it's probably gonna fail. So really quickly, you can always close this and you can always delete a key. So if you click on the key itself, you can just hit delete or regenerate that of course will actually change this key. The other part is we wanna have key restrictions. This is critical to making sure that you don't get a crazy bill. This is where those permissions come in, right? Um, so a couple of things that you can do is right here, right? So you can do an IP address. So if you actually do a search on Google, what's my IP address, you can actually paste that value in here uh, and that will actually prevent access from anything but that IP address. This is also very useful if you're using a server and all that. Um, you can also use a web page itself. So different web pages doing the request. But again, we don't have a web application. So I'm actually gonna leave mine as none because I'm just testing this out, but I will restrict the API, right? So API restrictions are gonna be just the two APIs that I have. So if I search for the geocoding one, I should see this. You can also type to filter geocoding 
and then places. Now I actually will not see these APIs if they are not activated. Uh, or at least that's how it's always been. So I'm gonna go ahead and save this. And now I have my API key. I have my API services activated. So now I'm actually ready to start doing API calls. So I wanna help you actually parse the documentation to be able to use the geocoding API as well as the places API. Uh, but like many APIs, the general rule of thumb is you grab some sort of endpoint, some sort of URL, uh, some parameters that might go into that URL, and then we actually just pass in our API key, which we already have, uh, and then we actually run our request. So those are the questions you need to answer when you're going through the docs themselves. Okay, so if we look at the docs, we've got our Google Maps documentation here. And if we just look for geocoding API and do a quick search for that. Again, it's not geolocation, it's just geocoding. And we scroll down a little bit to the geocoding product. Okay, and then what we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna wanna see their sample request here. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy the sample request and back into our notebook we paste that one in okay so uh really simple we've got our base endpoint right here i have some stuff called json so i'm going to go ahead and give it let's say data type and i'm going to give it json and i'll pass that in as well and then it's giving me a parameter of address so i'll turn that into a dictionary a parameter um address and then in this case it gave me it looks like google's address so i'm going to not leave it in as a string but rather replace those pluses with spaces as in like a more realistic you know lookup that you would do right so somebody would more likely copy and paste that address than the other one on the url and then finally it has a api key so the key so these are the parameters. So key is that API key. Okay, so um, the reason I knew that these were the parameters was one, I actually reviewed the docs already, uh, but also in a URL, this is how it goes. Whenever you see that ampersand sign, then that's a new parameter in there. That's just a general rule of thumb when it comes to URLs. So I actually need to convert the parameters themselves into being actual URL parameters. So I'll call this URL params, and that's gonna be equal to, well, we actually have to import another thing in here. So above this API key, actually I'll put it here. So it's kind of in logical order in a way. We're gonna import from URL lib.parse, we're gonna import URL encode. This is something I use a lot. So URL encode of those params. And now we can actually see what those params are. So if I run this, uh, we gotta make sure we run each cell. And if I run this, I now see that this is either roughly identical or exactly identical to this. When I say roughly is because sometimes the URL parameters don't necessarily go in the order you may expect. I believe they'll probably go in alphabetical order, but that also might not be true. Okay, so now I've got my parameters set and ready. I no longer need the sample, of course, so I can get rid of that one and actually have my new URL is equal to, well, we need to put this F string in here and it's gonna be our endpoint. And then we need to use a question mark and then finally our URL params. And put that string at the end there. We hit enter. So I print this out. Okay, so typically speaking, when your URLs have parameters, you need to have a question mark, and that will start all of the URL parameters as we did. So notice the ampersand's in there, and URL encode makes that happen for us from a simple dictionary. So now we have our actual URL. Uh, but this isn't quite what I want, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and copy this and define extract lat lang as in latitude and longitude. So lat long is probably a better way to say it. Okay, so we've got all of that same data in there. 
And I'm actually gonna pass the data type in here as well. Another option for that data type, according to their docs, is XML. But of course, I wanna use JSON. I think JSON's a lot easier to parse. And the parameters, well, the real parameter is just our query string here. So this is really a address or postal code, right? And that will just pass in here. So if it's invalid, we will get a response from the backend that it's invalid. Okay, so now what I'm just gonna do is return that URL and let's run that. And I'll just go ahead and say the exact same URL we did. Again, this is just a sample for a moment. And that gives us that URL. Cool. So now let's actually use Python requests. Really simple. R equals to requests dot get and URL. And if R dot status code in range 200 to 299, then we're going to return the JSON response. So return r.json. Otherwise, we'll return an empty dictionary. And if you've been following along with me, you know that I typically put those things in reverse and say if it's not in that range. Okay. So if I run that, uh, what I should get is I get request not to find. No surprise there. Go ahead and bring that in. So import requests and run that again and now i actually get some data get some results cool so the data i actually want to send back is results so our json and this is going to be results instead okay so those are my all of the possible results for this uh, but really for me i actually just want to get the very first result or the result that has um, the latitude and longitude for me Okay, so this data, we want to get the zeroth element here. Should be just one anyway. Uh, and then it gives me a dictionary of items. So if I actually do dot keys as the return, I can see what the various keys are. So in my case, I want to grab the geometry itself. So let's return back those results. And this time I'll just use the key of ge geometry on that call and there we go we're actually getting the data that i was looking for which was specifically the latitude and longitude uh, so i'm, I'm going to go ahead and just cut this out and paste it up here and then also include the location here and that should actually return back my latitude and longitude values um, so i actually want to put this into my lat lon dictionary and i'll go ahead and try to set that because in some cases it will be a successful lookup but it won't find that data so i'll just go ahead and say accept so any sort of exception i'll just say pass and then we'll return that dictionary there now i could actually return those actual values right so i could do git lat and latlang dot git length or longitude okay so that might be a better way to go about doing this. Uh, so let's go ahead and try this out. And that gives me a tuple back of those latitude and longitude. And if I mess it up, you know, by messing up the try block, let's put a quote in here or something. Uh, and I'll, ah, I would still need good syntax. Let's try that again with good syntax, correct syntax. Uh, then it sends back none, none. Okay, so that's if it's missing. And I run it again. And there we go. We've got our latitude and longitude. Of course, that's the using the geocoding API, and I did a lot of the work for you there, but this actually gives us an opportunity to think about how to actually reverse a URL or reverse what we did here to really understand all of the things that are going into it. Uh, so let's go ahead and copy this URL here, and I'm gonna scroll to the bottom, and we'll go ahead and just say to parse, and this is gonna be equal to that URL. And again, this could be any URL itself. We're also gonna go ahead and do from URL lib.parse, we're gonna import URL parse as well as parse underscore QSL. So QSL as in parse query string. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look here. First and foremost, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call URL parse to that to parse 
URL that we had. And what we get is a parsed result. So this result we can use in other ways, right? So if I wanted to, I could say scheme equals to that URL to parse dot scheme. And I could do that for each other piece. Netlock, that will give you the root domain there, including like www dot or no, none of that. Uh, finally, the path, the actual resource path. Uh, this gives me that option. Uh, I do have params in here. In this case, it doesn't show me params. Instead, it has what's called a query string, which is what we actually passed through here. So to do the reversing of what we did up here, I actually want to take that params and call them a query string. So that means then I'll say query string equals to that query. Okay, and this of course will give me, you know, that parsed out for on defaults, right? So it does it for me, of course. Uh, so I need to convert this into a dictionary now. So to do that, we do query, well, let's call it query tuple first, and it's parse QSL of that query string. So after I do that, I can see that my query tuple is that. And then finally, my query dictionary is just calling dict on the tuple itself or tuple. Uh, and then we can take a look at that. And there we go. So we have the arguments that need to go in as the query string, which I called it the URL parameters. Um, those are often used interchangeably. Not always, but you know, we can call it that. Um, so we've got our dictionary here now. And I also had my endpoint to grab my endpoint. Let's actually turn, um, let's add the parsed URL to just using this right here. Probably should have done that first anyway. Okay, so now I have this parsed URL. I can say my endpoint equals to, well, it's the F string here, and that's gonna be parsed URL that's scheme. Right, scheme, and then that's going to be colon slash slash, and then parsed URL dot netlock, and that gives us the domain path. It has a leading URL there, so then we can do or a leading slash, excuse me. So parsed URL dot path. This should give me that new endpoint. So let's actually call this endpoint and close off string there. So we can print out that endpoint. And netlock does not have a K on it. Okay, so there's my root endpoint. So I now have my query dictionary and my root endpoint. So of course I could kind of bring this full circle now and it's, it's exactly this up here. Of course it doesn't actually parse out that data type thing, um, but this is another way to parse a URL without using something like a regular expression. Uh, you, can, you can actually grab what that data is. And of course, I do want to show you this in the documentation as well. So let's go ahead and do that. So jumping back into the documentation. So Google Maps doc documentation where I got that original sample URL. Uh, I actually want to jump into the developer guide. This will show you a little bit more as to what's going on. Uh, you can see what geocoding is as an example. We just showed you what it is. Um, and then it gives you, you know, the API request format. All right, so here we go. We've got our endpoint here. It gives us that output format and parameters. Okay, so the output format could be one of these two. We talked about that. And then URLs must be properly encoded. Okay, so we did that. We did that with URL encode. So uh, the actual things that we need, required parameters, that's what you need to look for is required parameters. They give you a lot of data in here as well, and it gives you ways to encode it. Um, you can also do other kinds of things, right? So you've got the option to pass in address as a parameter or components, which I didn't cover, but that's okay. Uh, and then finally, definitely your API key, right? Uh, so actually getting better at this will then be like, okay, what are other parameters I can add in, which is bounds, language, right? So some sort of language, if you need to pass that language in, the region it's in, um, so this is different for different places in the world. And again, components, it has another way to add components. Uh, and, then it, and then it'll show you actual responses uh, that come back. So this is how you would break it down without going through the actual request itself, is you can see all of these different responses. 
So there's that key that I used of geometry, location, lat, long, right? And, and naturally you could also grab the formatted address. So this would be a cool way if somebody entered their address in and you needed the correct address, you could send this to the API, get the formatted address, suggest it to your user, and then come back with the actual you know, address that, that comes from the Google geocoding API. Okay, so that's actually doing a couple really interesting things, I think, and this is why you actually wanna learn how to build these clients yourself is so you can parse API documentation after you do some of your own experimenting just based off of a simple example. Uh, that I think is the best way to learn it because then you can be like, oh, well, what if I accidentally forgot a parameter? What happens then? Uh, we'll see that a little bit more when we go into the places API. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and use that places API. So of course, in the Google Maps platform, we're gonna click on documentation and just do a quick search for places API. And if we scroll down a little bit, we'll see products here. You could also scroll down on the platform page and not do a search and find places API as well. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and open this up. And then on the left-hand side, I'm gonna go into the dev guides for place search. So if we scroll down a little bit, what we'll see is a base endpoint here. And of course it has output and parameters on there. Output can be JSON or XML and the parameters are listed below. So I'll go ahead and copy this and bring it into my places API. And I'll go ahead and say base endpoint places and I'll pass that in. Now my output, I'll just hard code it as JSON. I always wanna use JSON as my outputs. As I mentioned before, it's just a little bit easier to work with. And then I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of that question mark uh, parameters. So the params I'll set is gonna be based off of a dictionary. And so I'll go ahead and look at the parameters I need. Well, I need key input, like the actual search, and then the input type it is, which apparently we can search by phone number, which is pretty cool, uh, but you have to do it in the international format. So I'm not gonna do the phone number part, but it is cool to know that it's there. Uh, and then I'm also gonna add in a few optional parameters. So let's do the first three. So key, input, and input type. So we'll go ahead and say key. And then of course is our API key, the input itself. Um, I'm gonna just go ahead and say Mexican food because Mexican food is my favorite. And then input type and the options were text query or phone number. I'm gonna use text query. And then I'm gonna go ahead and encode these. So params encoded equals to URL encode and these params. Okay, and of course we already imported URL and code uh, a while back up here. Okay, so then my actual places endpoint is going to combine all these. So first off we'll do an F string for each piece and that's gonna be the base endpoint places and then the encoded parameters. And of course I need to actually have a question mark here uh, to make sure that my encoded parameters work. And let's go ahead and take a look at what this looks like and make sure that there's no errors. Doesn't seem like there is. Okay, uh, so that of course is the base requirements, but we wanna go a little bit further than the base requirements and have a few optional parameters. And one of them being the location bias and another one being the fields that we actually want from that place data. And one of the reasons that we actually did latitude and longitude already was for this lookup here, right? So there's two different kinds of lookups that we can do and including a location bias is absolutely something we wanna include. So I'm gonna go ahead and first off use the, that location bias and then we'll add in the fields that we want. Uh, so inside of here, I'm gonna go ahead and above the params, I'm gonna go ahead and add my first location bias as a point bias. Okay, so the point bias runs like this. It's point colon and then some argument and another argument. Of course, the arguments are latitude and longitude. So I actually am gonna set a hard code of the latitude and longitude at first, and I'm gonna do it based off of mountain view at this point, because that's one that I have readily available, but you can use pretty much any of them. 
Um, and then I'll go ahead and add these down here. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and pass in my latitude and longitude here. And what I can say is say, if use circular, and of course use circular initially, we'll go ahead and say it's false. And then I'll say if use circular, then I'll give a radius in meters. So some sort of radius in meters, I'll go ahead and say a thousand. And then my location bias just changes just slightly to being circle. And then my radius, so the radius number itself at that. And that corresponds to this right here. Okay, and then I'll go ahead and add this into my parameters. So params, and it's going to be location bias, and I'll set it equal to that variable of location bias. So we open that up, and there we've got a more structured URL based off of all of this. And then of course, if I change this to use circular, I should actually see the use circle one in there as well. Cool. So I'm gonna go ahead and leave that as false to start. The next thing is our actual fields. Now fields of a, uh, are the data we actually want to have come back, right? So if we come down here, we see that there are a number of items that we might have in here. So I'm gonna go off with some of their defaults and I'm gonna add it into my default params as well, not necessarily an additional argument that I do like I did with location bias. But instead, I'm just going to come in here and do something like this. And it's fields and then address component name and geometry. Again, the documentation is going to give you some additional options for the, the field categories and whatnot, uh, which is pretty cool. So perhaps permanently closed would be one of them that we might want to have on there because we don't want permanently closed items. So we can just pass that in here as well. And now our URL lookup is quite a bit more complex. Uh, but do know, like, we now have a pretty standardized way of formatting these URL lookups. And even though just by glancing at it, it's hard to parse, we can still, you know, go backwards and parse it much like we did before. And it'll still give us that same dictionary, which is pretty cool. So now let's go ahead and try our, out our request. So I'll use r equals to requests.get. And then this places endpoint. And then I'll just first print out the R status code. And then we'll do R.json to see what actually is returned. Okay, so uh, I'm getting unsupported field name address component. Okay, so that obviously was incorrect fields. So it's coming back up here. These are the basic field categories. Looks like I probably should have read a little bit more um, into what that meant. So I'll use these formatted address instead. And I'll put that in there and try that again. And there we go. So um, it gives me a formatted address and it gives me a place that actually exists, right? So this is not a list of items, but rather the closest item to this itself, right? So this latitude and longitude. Um, so that's interesting, right? Now, if I actually use the circle circular, let's go ahead and see what that does. I'll go ahead and say true. And gives me the same place. Um, and if I open it up quite a bit more, let's say 5,000 radius, 5,000 meters, uh, it gives me another place. So it's only giving me one actual response back. So if I wanted to have more than just one single response, uh, what I can do is the nearby search requests. So this is just a different endpoint with roughly the same arguments in here, except the location is now a required parameter. So you need the latitude and longitude, your keys in there, and then you are gonna pass in a keyword of some kind as well. So let's go ahead and add this one in as well to see if this might be the actual responses that we want. So we'll come down here and say the places endpoint two equals to that endpoint. Again, I'm gonna use JSON and I'll remove those parameters, just put an end quote and the params I need. So I'll go ahead and go ahead and do params two, just to, to differentiate it from the other one and key location radius. Okay, so key is there. 
location. And I think the location is going to be in the same kind of format of before, which is just lat lang. We will just double check that in a moment. So using an F string here, back into the places API. Yeah, so latitude and longitude, exactly the same as before. Radius, how large of a search radius we want. In this case, I'll go ahead and use the number, let's say 1500, or not 15,000, but 1500 meters. Okay, and then the next part of keyword. Keyword, and again, we'll say Mexican food. That's going to be the actual search. And then notice that I have a number of things that I can try out in here as well. Um, the rank by, you can add in a rank by. Rank by must not be included if radius is. Okay, so something to note. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and, and encode these. So params to encoded equals to URL encode and those parameters. So places URL equals to the base URL or base endpoint places endpoint two question mark and params encoded or params two encoded. There we go. And then we'll finally do the request. So R2 equals to requests.get and that URL and then R2.json. Okay, so we run that and now we actually get a list of items back. Okay, so uh, that's pretty cool. That is allowing us to do a more robust search. Now, the difference between these is this one is looking for a specific place. Uh, the first one is trying to find a specific place and it's going to give you the best example of that place, right? So if we scroll up a little bit here um, and it returns a single place, right? That's the point of that, right? And then the other one is going to find places nearby that general location. Uh, so once you actually find either one of those places, then you can actually go and get a place detail. So the place detail is yet another component to this that can allow us to actually get a individual detail item here, as we see with this place ID. So here's a good example. Let's go ahead and copy that and bring it over. And we'll go ahead and say detail, let's call this the you know, detail lookup. And we've got our, our URL here, our URL example. And so uh, there's a number of things that I can do. Let's go ahead and do base endpoint. And like usual, I'll just go ahead and cut this out. Okay, so we've got our place ID, we've got some fields in there, and then our API key. So then my params are gonna be place ID. And, you know, I'll have to set that somewhere. So I'll go ahead and use a variable of place ID. I'll actually use their example for the moment until I actually have a way to grab that single place ID. Let's cut this out and place ID. And then the fields, I'll go ahead and leave these as is. And changing the equals to key value pair. And then of course our API key in here. So comma and key is our API key. Okay, and then our actual URL is going to be all of these things as well. So let's call this actually the detail base endpoint, the detail params, and the detail URL, detail params encoded, URL encode, and those params. Okay, yet again, we're gonna use an F string down here. So base endpoint, and then those parameters. And then finally, let's go ahead and just do the lookup again. R equals to requests.get at TTR URL and then r.json to see what that is. Uh, and then I'm getting a formatted phone number and it's just giving me Google Australia. So that's 
that must be the place ID that it's got. Uh, so in this case, I'll just actually look for one of them that was responded. Uh, so that very first one, La Fiesta, let's actually use that actual place ID. Uh, so right now I actually don't see the ID inside of that lookup based off of the fields that I gave. So going back in to the details, we might need to actually include the place ID on our search. So going back up to our search, let's go ahead and find all the parameters here for the fields. Okay, so place ID is one of those fields that we can add in. I thought that that might be the case, but let's just always use the documentation in very specific things like that. And there we go. So now there's our place ID here. So we'll go ahead and use this one now and replace it there. Do a search and look up. Uh, now I'm getting that result. So I, all, all I got was my name, my rating, and my formatted number. These fields, I have the sneaking suspicion that these fields are identical. So I can come in here and use something like formatted address. And sure enough, they are identical. That's pretty cool. Okay, so uh, naturally what I still need to do is turn all of this into a more effective way for doing the lookup, not just going one by one. And I'll actually do that by creating our own API client specifically for this. But what we wanted to do up until this point was be able to test out the API, make some changes as we needed, and you know add additional information if we want to based off of their actual documentation because that's likely to change, right? They're likely to add either add additional things or remove them or just change how they're formatted. Um, so it's really good to always check the documentation when you're trying to do one of these kinds of API lookups, especially when it gets a little bit complex like a place because there's just a lot of data points that could be added to that place. Now I will say that when you add additional fields, there is more cost to it. I don't remember exactly how the cost works, but I do know that they charged based off of how much data you are collecting or looking up, um, not just based off of the fact that you are doing the lookup. So that is something that's interesting to, to research more. Uh, but again, the vast majority of things that we're doing here aren't ever gonna cost you anything. Um, unless they drastically change how their API works, but uh, that's uh, that's pretty cool. So that's it for this part. Now let's go ahead and actually turn it into an API client. Let's go ahead and create our Google Maps API client, and I'm gonna go ahead and copy our previous one. And the reason I'm doing this is so I just have some of that code to reference. I'll go ahead and rena rename this to my Google Maps API. Um, and you might actually wanna name it closer to something Pythonic, so a Python module, so Google Maps client, something more like that. Because in day 19, I actually show you how to export this with one single command to turn it into an actual Python file. Uh, it's not really that hard. You can also export it inside of here as well. So, I mean, if you wanted to have it as a Python file, that would be the way to do it. Okay, so now let's go ahead and just delete some of the extraneous things that we just simply don't need. So some of the cells that are in here, just kind of referencing other pieces. Uh, but the first thing I wanna do is actually put all of my imports at the top. So let's cut out all of this code for the imports. <laughs> Typically speaking, that's how you're gonna do it anyway. Uh, but as you code in a notebook, you know, sometimes you don't do it that way. Sometimes you do it more in a logical, like, hey, this is when I need it, so I'm gonna import it then. Uh, but then once you actually get into the final piece, that's when you'll change it. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and call this just a Google Maps client API. And what I want to do is set this as class and we'll call it Google Maps client. And it takes in an object here. And the object itself, well, we'll declare a few of those things in just a moment. So the first thing that I absolutely wanna get is my extracted latitude and longitude. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and say lat equals to none and LNG or longitude equals to none. So that's the initial thing that I'm going to use. And now I can actually copy the method or the function that I did before and turn it into the class method in here. And it will now take a postal code and it will use that same data type um, now, in this case, I'm going to go ahead and add in data type up here. 
So every request uses the exact same data type instead of changing it in here, okay? So this is now gonna just be self.datatype, okay? So of course the address or postal code, well, uh, perhaps I wanna have the location in here as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and do address, or rather, let's call this the location query, and we'll give it a none initially. So whatever that is, I'm gonna remove that and put this in as my parameter in here. So self.location query. Okay, so that's a good start. We've got our endpoint with the data type, We've got our location query, uh, and then finally the lat lang will be reset here. So we'll go ahead and just call this self, um, let's actually call it lat, long and we'll give it equal to those things. And then I can still return those values, but also set them on the class itself. So self.lat equals to lat and self.long or longitude equals to LG. Okay, so this extraction then will allow me to then use it later. Okay, so uh, perhaps I wanna initialize this client this way. So we'll go ahead and do init and we'll do self. And now I'm going to go ahead and say address or uh, postal code. We'll do args and keyword args. So basically, when I initialize this client, um, I want to actually grab whatever that postal code would be. And so I'll go ahead and run the super call on init first and pass in args and keyword args. And then I'll go ahead and call self extract lat lang before i do that i'll go ahead and say self dot location query equals to the address or postal code whatever we're passing in here and then we'll try and extract it and i'll also go ahead and say if the location query is not none because you might not need it so if location query is not equal to none then we'll go ahead and do that so I'll go ahead and add this in as an optional argument here by passing in as none. Okay, so since we've got that, we also have this API key here. That is, of course, another thing that I want to pass in here. And this time, I absolutely want to make sure that I have an API key. So if API key equals to none, then we'll go ahead and raise an exception. And I'll just say API key is required. And then, of course, my API key will also be a parameter to this object. And then I'll go ahead and say self.api key equals to the past API key. And then now in the future, we'll go ahead and just use self.api key for extracting this latitude and longitude. All right, so let's go ahead and try out our client now. I'm going to go into the kernel and restart and clear output. And I'm going to go ahead and now do each cell. The API key, I'm actually gonna change the name of that to Google API key. And then we'll go ahead and use our map client below it. So I'll insert a cell above or below the client, either way. And I'll go ahead and say client equals to that client. I hit enter. And of course, it's gonna give me this exception that I need that API key, no surprise there. So I'll go ahead and do API key equals to, and it's the Google API key, of course and I'll hit enter. Okay, so I can print out the lat lang here. So print client lat, print client long, and we get none, none. No big surprise, I actually didn't pass the address or postal code, so let's go ahead and do that. And this time I'll go ahead and just do Newport Beach CA, and I run that, and I get an error that it has no attribute data type. Well, that's strange, so this is, this is where the error is happening right here. So line 18, and that's this, self.data type. Well, I set the data type, oh, that says data data. Ha, huh, that's a silly error, uh, but maybe you caught it. If not, that's okay. So then when I run it, I get my client latitude and longitude. That's great. Okay, so um, that is certainly redoing the geocoding API in this client. That's a good start. Next, what I wanna do is actually do the search but before i do that i'm going to get rid of some of these old cells i no longer need these any longer so let's get rid of all that and we'll go ahead and delete those cells 
Next, I will do the actual search itself. Now, I did start out where it was finding a single place from text. I'm actually not gonna use that one. Instead, what I'm gonna use is a nearby search. So that's this right here. I'm gonna go ahead and copy that and we'll go ahead and paste it in. So define search and it's gonna be self and keyword. And I'm gonna leave in a default keyword as Mexican food. And then we'll paste this in here and I got a number of things going on. Okay, so first and foremost, I'm gonna change this just to endpoint and the data type, so self.data type or the lookup type, right? Should probably be lookup type, not data type, but I'll leave it in like that. And then my params and self.api key. The location, well, it's gonna be self.lat and self.long. Okay, so here's a really good opportunity to change our the way we initialize the lat, latitude and longitude based off of the search potentially, right? So if I wanted to change the latitude and longitude, perhaps this is where I would do it. So if I add it in, let's just add in a location being none, right? So if I am gonna change this, if I say location is not equal to none, then I'll go ahead and run that same extraction. So this time I'll go ahead and say lat long equals to what that extraction would be. And so I'll actually pass in that same argument into the lat long here. And instead of doing self.location query, I will just go ahead and say, if location is not equal to none, then my location query as an argument here, I'll, I'll actually call this loc query to not get it too confusing, equals to that location. And the default loc query will be self.location query. So loc query equals to self.location query. So whatever that default is that I passed up here will be what the extract lat lang will do. And then I'll go ahead and come in here like that. Okay, so that gives my search a little bit more robustness to it. It will actually grab this lat long. Uh, so that also means that down here, I wanna actually reference the ones in the class as well. So lat long equals to self.lat and self.on. And then I set them here. So instead of referencing the class, I would just reference the local method for those latitude and longitude. Okay, uh, next, the, the actual search radius. This also might be an argument I wanna pass into the search itself. So I'll use a default of a thousand meters. And then of course my keyword itself will be this. Okay, so radius, here we go. And params encoded is now our new encoded parameters. And then finally our URL, I can leave it in as places URL is gonna take that endpoint and then the parameters themselves. And then let's just go ahead and return the JSON data to start. So the request itself, I'll leave it in as R. And if our status code not in range 200 to 299, We'll just return back an empty dictionary. Otherwise, we'll return back the JSON. Perhaps we redefine that or make that a little bit more robust later. But as of now, this works just fine. So the next thing is actually adding the detail lookup. So again, I'll go ahead and copy this same thing and paste it up here. This one is gonna be a lot more straightforward. So detail, and it's gonna be self and place ID. And we just wanna replace our original place ID. So I can have a default value in here uh, if I wanted to. So I'll go ahead and do that. Okay, so I've got my detail lookup here now. And yet again, I will do this same res response request argument here. And this time it's gonna just be our detail URL. Okay, so now I should have a working client. Let's go ahead and give it a shot. Um, it's certainly possible that I mixed up some things based off of my search and how I did this. Now, the detail does not require the actual location at all, just the search will, okay? So we'll go ahead and do client.search, and this time I'll go ahead and say tacos and hit enter. I get an empty response, so perhaps I have something incorrect in here. I probably do. 
Um, and then I will try a different location. So I'll do location equals to uh, Newport Beach again. And there we go. So I actually did have a invalid lookup in here. And this should be self.extractLatLang and passing in this argument here. All right, so let's do another search and I'm still getting an empty dictionary. Now this could be a valid response, but I'm gonna assume that it's not. So what I wanna do is actually come in to my request itself and just do print r.text. Like I wanna see what the request is happening and perhaps I also wanna see the URL too, okay? So right off the bat, I see the problem and that's this right here. This is the URL. Uh, so we have a number of issues with how this URL is doing its lookup. Ha, and hopefully you caught these things. I did it really fast. First thing is the endpoint. We need to use that F string. Second thing is the parameters that I use. This should be encoded parameters, not just the parameters themselves. Um, now I'm gonna actually get rid of the print statement and do that run again. And now I actually get some responses here. Pretty cool. And you know, depending on how I change the location, let's try, I even wrote the wrong address or wrong search field itself and it still looked in Newport Beach. Gotta love Google Maps. Um, so if I do something like Irvine, California, it, it should actually give me a different location for Irvine, loca Irvine, California, which is cool. And of course I get to use a specific address for there as well, or even like a zip code, like the one for Newport or part of Newport 92660. Uh, this time it actually gave me a, a zero results. Uh, so it looks like the zip code isn't necessarily working as I hoped. Um, so that's not something I really tested, but the Newport Beach stuff is, which is cool. Um, okay, so the next thing is actually testing out this detail to just make sure that that's working. I see that there's a place ID right here. I'll just go ahead and grab that one with my client. So insert below and client.detail and my place ID equals to that. Okay, so again, I get an API key is not defined. So in my detail, I need to reference the correct API key, which is the one that's attached to this lookup or to this class itself. Um, and let's just verify our URLs are doing the encoding and everything like that. Um, the data type I also want to actually pass in here is if I need to change it to XML, then I don't have to do too much customization. So let's go ahead and run it again. Okay, so my search worked again and my detail lookup also worked. Okay, and it gave me the fields that I declared. Okay, cool. Uh, so naturally I can actually adjust how this is done. So I can come in here and say fields equals to and use these as individual string items in here. So you don't have to always write out the comma separated string. I actually prefer doing it this method so then I can see what other string values that I might want to have. Uh, and then down here, we just say, you know, we just join it like that. So join fields, the actual argument itself. I actually don't think I need that space. Let's try that again. And this time it seemed to work. Um, but to really verify that it's working, let's go ahead and restart and clear the output and then run this again. And there we go. So it is working. So now I have search detail and the actual Latlang extraction. Um, so this extraction did work for the most part. It didn't actually work on our zip code, zip code address. There might be additional parameters that we need to look up to have a zip code or poster code work there. Um, in my testing, I thought that it actually did work just by passing the zip code itself, which in this case, it did not, right? So 92660 is the postal code for, oh, and there you go. So you actually do have a postal code and that is working. Let's get rid of this location here and searching tacos and again it's returning zero results uh, based off of that latitude and longitude perhaps it's just looking in too narrow of a location uh, so you might need to you know expand this to something different or the actual region itself like the radius for the search 
maybe it needs to be uh, much larger. Let's try that larger radius. And I'll do like 25,000. I think that's the max. And there we go. Yeah, so it was the actual radius itself. So, so the zip code did look it up fine. It's just the search radius that I had was way too small. So perhaps I would use something a little bit larger by default, maybe 5,000 meters, something like that. And instead of 25,000, that's kind of a big radius to search. Okay, so 5,000 meters is now pulling through. Cool. And then, of course, my client detail works based off of whatever item that's in here. So now I'm going to go ahead and delete the rest of these cells because they were copied over. And we'll go ahead and do edit and delete cells. And there is our API client. Now, of course, this is not nearly as full featured as the official one by Google Maps, right? So the Python client for Google Maps not only has the Places API as well as the geocoding API, but it has several other APIs as well. And realistically, that's probably the one you would end up using in the long run. And they have documentation and all that. Uh, but now that you know how to make your own client, it's a really cool opportunity to do this for many other services. That's kind of the point here is to get really comfortable with building these clients so that you're just very resilient to them changing and you can change them whenever you need to. So there's absolutely a number of things that we can do to improve this client. And I'm going to leave that to you. One of them being how we actually formulate our endpoints themselves. Another one being how we actually call our requests. Notice that we've done roughly the same thing a number of times in here. That's encoding the parameters, that's doing a request. Now, a better client would not do it multiple times. Instead, it would do it one time and change it as it needs to, right? So uh, that is definitely a nice little challenge for you. Uh, the next thing is, how do you actually enrich a Pandas data set using this. Now, even if you haven't used pandas enough, that is something that I think you would want to work towards. So make a note of that is enriching a pandas data set using this Google Maps API client that we created here. So that's it for this one. Thanks so much for watching day 20. Hopefully you got a lot out of this. If you end up fixing the Google Maps API client, like the challenge I left you with, please let me know in the comments the gist or the actual repo that you have on GitHub because I would love to take a look at them and maybe give some pointers directly into your repo. I can't say, for instance, I will do that for everyone, but maybe the first few that do actually comment, I'll be able to look at and give those recommendations. Thanks again. I'll see you in the next one.